I'm going to kick this off. Uh, my name is Glenn Penley, and uh, I'm on a research and development team for a security company. And um, this talk was supposed to be on JavaScript deobfuscation. Well, that's what it says on the paperwork anyway. Uh, um, it's actually going to go uh, more of taking a basic attack and walking through how the malware gets from A to B. We're going to break down code. We're going to be deobfuscating some JavaScript, but it's not going to be an hour long walking through JavaScript code samples. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because the, uh, I, I don't speak that often at conferences and stuff like that, but every time I've ever been asked to speak, it's always, always been after lunch, and half the people have always, like, fallen asleep during my <laughs> talks. So uh, it's a little interesting now that it's right before dinner, and... Um, yeah, you're awake because you're just. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully this will be. Well, hopefully you're not asleep still uh, halfway through it, but um, it should be about I'm hoping between a half hour, forty five minutes, and um, the reason why I I kind of wanted to go over this concept or this this talk is because when the salespeople in my company actually have me go and talk to people. Um, I've talked to some really smart people, but I mean, people that can reverse engineer a piece of malware better than I can, but they have absolutely no idea how the malware got into their environment. They have no idea how their IPS just completely let it go by, why AV didn't detect it, why, you know, all those other things. So what I'm going to do is just take this basic example and just from start to finish show how, um, how you can evade the IPS, how you can evade firewalls, uh, AV, sandboxes, and all that stuff. Sound good? Um, I didn't really also know what the level of, uh, you know, who I was going to be talking to exactly. So I apologize in advance if it's a little too basic for, for some of you guys. So there's only three slides that we'll look at. Uh, this is the most um, in-your-face slide. Um, what it's, it's kind of representing what we're going to be going over. So the first thing that, uh, as a part of the attack we're going to look at, is actually getting you know, the landing page, how somebody, you know, um, you know, how you get somebody to click on it. We won't really go into that too much. We're going to really start once you get to the landing page. Um, and then from there, we're going to go really to the escalation, like looking at the JavaScript, looking at some JavaScript packers, uh, just some obfuscation in general. Um, and then go over the concept of noise reduction. So we'll, we'll break down the code and look at how, after you deobfuscate the content, you know, in the JavaScript, how it's, it looks at what operating system you're running, what browser you're running, different things like that, and then makes the determination on what exploit it's going to run. So we'll go through all that type of stuff. Um, then we're going to look at shell code and then, you know, actually break down the shell code, not, not at too much. We won't look at the assembly or anything, but we'll use uh, some utilities that we, my group has written and uh, show you what the shell code was trying to do and then show how that's an example of more noise reduction with uh, evading sandboxes. And then lastly, the actual movement of the malware, so encoding and different stuff like that, and how you know things like magic numbers and just simple XORing could easily be almost all host-based you know, uh, security stuff today. All right, so that's enough with the, the slides for now. So, before we just jump right into um, the code itself, you know, we have to at least briefly talk about how people get onto the landing page, where they're actually going to get directed to get exploited and stuff like that. Um, you know, you could spend days talking about social engineering and all that stuff, and honestly, it's kind of boring. But um, it's it's pretty interesting. Like, how many people in here are contractors for the government? It, it's it's kind of sad to me um, to kind of say this, but it is ridiculously simple to kind of target contractors in the military or in the government in general. You know, if it's a lot of government agencies have the the bad habit of putting CTR at the end of their contractor usernames. I just I, started having to requirements on purpose. I, well, I, I know they do that, but it's that's not that's not the smartest thing in the world to do. You know, when, when if you think about it, um, I've 
proved this point with a friend of mine who works over at DISA, that if you, if you have, like for example, whenever somebody sends out a, a, an RFP or whatever they call it to, to get contracts and stuff like that, it's all public domain. And what will happen a lot of times um, is that, and I mean, it's public knowledge. You can see who wins the, the award and stuff like that. All you have to do to really target somebody and really make it simple to get somebody to click on your link is just look at who the, the sub is for that. Because a lot of times they'll partner with a small company, like a really tiny company. And a lot of times they'll have their, their people actually look at proposals for other things. So by you know just doing a few hours of research into figuring out who won a certain contract and let's say SAIC or whoever the, the big contracting companies are, they may have partnered up with Little Company A. You just start focusing on who works in Little Company A and craft a, a, like a, a PDF or something and just send it to just those people in that small little company and say, hey, we're, we're working on a new proposal. Can you open up this PDF and just send it? just to the people in their organization at .ctr, you'd be surprised at how many people click on it. Just like, oh, I'm going to help out, you know, be a good soldier, and there you go. You got them. Now, that's, you know, just kind of uh, you know, simplistic stuff. More um, as far as, like, targeting and getting people to click on things. You know, Aurora happened a few years ago. Everybody's heard about that by now. But what's really interesting about that, in, in this case specifically, is that it was uh, an exploit in IE6 that was actually vulnerable. And the, the, there's a couple of companies, but Google, for example, is one of the ones that got hacked. And you would never expect people in Google running IE6, correct? So what the, the people that they actually targeted were regression testers that they knew would be running those browsers, you know, and because has anybody in here done any software development before? It's a pain in the ass to do QA and open up, have all these different browsers and do different testing to see what will happen. So the people that you know performed Aurora, they specifically focused on just the regression testers in these companies that they knew would be running those. So there's different levels of getting people to you know focus on them, to click on certain things, to to get um, you know what what you need to do. So it's enough about that. Let's actually get to the landing page and start looking at. Um, some code because that's really what we're here for, right? It's probably worth mentioning that it's, uh, I mean, if it's not targeted, it's much wider spread than many people. Yep. Add regression or, you know, uh, automatic signal injection into place that can lead back to a possible JavaScript code. Yeah, so as far as the just general malware like black hole and different exploit ca uh, kits, things like iframes and different stuff like that, uh, um, a lot of them. <laughs> Based on a lot of the research and different things that we have on the, the technology that, that we create, my coworker Chris is here, and he can attest to this, but um, there's like a really popular site out on the web today, uh, girlsinyogapants.com. I mean, people are, I mean, it's all over the place, but it's infected right now based because of ads that people put on there. So you'll open up the page and you'll look at, you know, a girl in yoga pants, and there's a little ad on the side that's actually infecting you you know, based and it's redirecting you to this landing page. Um, it's it's kind of funny, but um, so yeah. So things like iframes, everybody knows what that is pixel by pixel. You'll never see it, but your browser's smart enough to open it up. There, it's redirecting you to open up just a little pixel size um, little frame, and in that frame, it could be redirecting you to open up. You know, basically whatever. Is that what you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this right here, let's let's say this is our landing page, um, technically our landing page in this attack. And this is actually a real attack from, it was a, an IE zero day that came out, I think last April or May. So it's a little bit older now, um, but this is the, the entire code sample. Um, it actually started from, this was the page and it just redirected you source login.js. So your browser smart enough, you open up login.js, and this is what we have. And this is an example of, uh, of a JavaScript packer. Um, tons of, like everybody here has probably heard of, obviously, really familiar with executable packers. And a packer is just a self-extracting archive. So, you know, when you zip something, obviously you'd have to unzip it and then execute it. A packer 
compresses the object and as it runs, it just decompresses and, and does what it has to do. The reason why, from an executable standpoint, people love to use uh, Packers is because it changes what looks like the content of the, the file itself, but the code is, um, is the same. So you can get around uh, like signature-based you know, AV stuff that are looking for certain MB5s and different things like that. The Packer will actually change what the executable looks like um, pretty easily. Now, a lot of people that I've talked to, um, surprisingly, had no idea that there's JavaScript packers out there. And this, more than anything, is, um, you know, you see, see tons of it if you really look for it. This, um, you know, the reason why uh, JavaScript packers are actually really, really hard to, um, to kind of deal with is because so many people on the web use them legitimately. If you go to almost any site on the web, any legitimate site, like big name site, they'll have their code obfuscated and they'll use Packers because they want to protect their intellectual property. So there's companies out there that are solely designed, this is uh, an example of one, it's like JavaScript obfuscator. This is a pretty good one. There's another one, I forgot what it was. Maybe Chris afterwards can, can bring it up. But for like, for $99, you can sit there and, and you can, it's a really solid Packer that all they do is just are designed specifically to not allow anybody to to deobfuscate the JavaScript in their code because they're protecting intellectual property mostly on legitimate sites. And their whole purpose is as soon as somebody breaks the, the obfuscation, they just release a patch and then you have to start all over again. And if you ever wanted to actually get around security tools, the way a lot of hackers are doing it with JavaScript packers is by these tools. They'll spend $99 and there's really nothing you could do about it. An example of why security tools, even though it's easy enough to, um, the same with executable packers, is to be able to define it. For example, here, this is an example of the D Networks packer. Uh, this has been around forever. Um, easily enough, you could write a signature that looks for something like this and say, you know, when I see function P A C K E D. First of all, can everybody see that? Okay. It's easy enough to, to kind of define that and say, you know, when I see this, I know this is the D Networks packer. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, back in 2007, um, you guys remember the, the ORCID social networking attack? A lot, of, a lot of people haven't heard of it. I have never even heard of the ORCID social network before until this happened. But um, this, this packer, uh, the Dean Edwards packer, was around before you know, the summer of 2007, and it was used legitimately just to kind of compress the content in, a, in the JavaScript in their page so the page can load. And, do all the stuff that you would legitimately use a packer for. And then around the fall of 2007, um, you know, different hackers started using this packer for malicious reasons. So a couple of different security companies decided whenever we see this, we're going to just start blocking the traffic and we're going to think it's bad. Well, all hell broke loose and people were just, they couldn't connect to their sites. And so the security companies relented and they took it off of their, you know, their other DAT files and signatures and all that stuff because just the uproar of, you know, looking at the function packed and firing on it just caused people just to go ape shit. So, um, so what happened was, like, in the November time frame, they took it off all the lists and stuff. And then in December, 700,000 people got their accounts exploited because on that ORCID social network with this, just using this packer alone. So it's, um, if you really wanted to get around you know, from a, a packing standpoint, it's easy enough to define it and to be able to say, yep, that's that packer, yep, that's that packer, but people, security companies anyway, aren't gonna start blocking them. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually take this, and this is just a simple compression uh, packer, there's nothing really uh, special about it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and put this into JS Beautifier, which is typically used if you're doing like, uh, JavaScript, you know, coding and stuff, and you see when people just do normal compression, it's hard as heck to read. So you'll use uh, you'll use this to just make it more le legible. Um, what you can do here, like in this site, I'm sure you guys know all about this. You can actually see detect packers and obfuscators. It could do basic ones. Um, anything more like the next one we'll look at, it, it won't do too too good of a job. So what we're going to do is we're going to just break this down, and this is going to be our first example of where the, the whole concept of noise reduction comes in. So 
you know, just because you can obfuscate and get past this, the defense, you don't actually want to ever run your code if you're going to get detected when you do run it. You want to be as stealthy as possible. And this is just that first example we're going to go through. Um, how many people in here just know JavaScript? Most, most people do. And even if you don't, you could probably just read this and figure out what it says. So the first thing we're going to do in this, when we look at it, is we're going to figure out what the operating system is that the, that the code is calling for. So you can see here, it's just a, a simple you know, if else type statement here, just basic logic. So if OS info .index of Windows NT, you're gonna return a value of WW50. And if that's true, then it'll continue on. If NT52, return this value. If 5.1, return this, so on and so forth. Um, you'd be surprised, especially a lot of younger guys, have no idea about the whole NT stuff. Back in the day, NT40, um, they still actually and then after NT40 came Windows 2000, that's when they really started naming the stuff. The, the machines actually, even today with Windows 7 and stuff, return back a value, things like Windows NT50, 52, 6.1. So for example, 6.1 I think is Windows 7 in 2008, release candidate 2. Uh, 5.1 is XP, I believe this is Windows 2000. And so depending on what operating system you're running, basically, it's going to return a value uh, associated with that. So next thing we're going to look at here is the actual browser that we're running. So if you're running MSIE 8, return 8, 7, 7, 6. If you're running Opera O, Chrome G. It's, it's just basic, simple logic, right? And this is where the noise reduction really comes into. So if operating system comes back WW51 and APPI, which is the browser, returns 8, open up this HTML page, login 8.htm else if operating systems WW51 and you're running IE6 go to this page everything else go to login.aspx so you can see in this attack the attacker really has two different exploits that he's trying to that he has available to him one that's going to exploit yeah like I said Windows or yeah XP is 550 would return 51 IE8 and 6 so he has two different exploits for these different browsers and, and OS pairs Anything else, if you're running a Mac or anything else, it's going to send you to this, this benign page. There's no reason to try to infect a machine that can't be infected and potentially, you know, bring, you know, notice to yourself, right? So let's pretend that I'm running XP in, in um, IE6 and go open up login6.htm. So here we go, we see this HTTP traffic, or HTTP traffic, HTML, and here we see the JavaScript. I'll tell you now, this isn't typical JavaScript that you'll see in a web page. A whole lot of numbers. So before we deobfuscate this content and start looking at some more stuff, this is really where I want to talk about the, the whole concept of normalization. Um, it, it's a pretty common term. Everybody's had some sort of familiarization with the term normalization? Well, the, the concept is, and this is really how we'll, we'll see this with when you're dealing with uh, later on in the attack as well, when you're dealing with getting around AV engines and, and different things like that. The whole concept of normalization is trying to take whatever the content is and gain value out of it. So in, in this case, let's say the traffic going across the wire, if you're from an IPS standpoint, if you wanted to evade any type of IPS, IDS, or network security device, you know, in different ways, all you have to do is just figure out how that, that security tool tries to normalize traffic to be able to either, you know, pattern matching or do whatever it does. If you know how it functions, you just have to, oh, to make it so it can't normalize the data, gain a value, and then apply the, whatever it does to determine if something's good or bad. That's why JavaScript obfuscation is so useful in, in attacks today because IPSs, IDSs, and different different tools can't normalize the traffic in real time. You know, as you'll see shortly, when we actually deobfuscate this content, every single network security tool in the world would be able to say, yep, this is bad, and fire on it. But when it's in this sort of format, it can't. Um, any questions up to this point? No, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory stuff. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to use this uh, little utility that we wrote 
I'm going to extract all the JavaScript out of the HTML and just put it into one file. Whenever I type in front of a large amount of people, I just can't do it. So, and then what I want to do is I'm going to actually, there's another utility that it's a JavaScript wrapper that we're going to apply to this JavaScript thing, um, to the JavaScript file that we just created out of the HTML using the Google V8. So this is a utility that we wrote. Um, it's a command line thing, um, but it, it's a JavaScript wrapper. So um, it's so the first part was we took the all the, the HTML file, we pulled out the all the JavaScript elements that were in that HTML file and just concatenated, aggregated into one JS file, and then we used this little utility that we have to basically deobfuscate the content and give us a, a dump file. Um, so it's it's kind of proprietary um, afterwards I can explain it a little bit more um, so Chris back there he's uh, the one that actually wrote so afterwards we'll we can discuss up as much as we can um, with it that's what you guys want to do. So here's the, the deobfuscated content. Um, as you can see right here, I mean, anybody in the security field should know right away, it's a bunch of shell code, coded shell code. You can see the U0C90, U0C90. It's, it's right away, you know it's a heap spray. It's, it's pretty, I mean, we're not going to break all this down. You can just see the, the looping and how the obfuscation actually happened. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, actually well, let me just before we actually break like like take this the shell code and just show you what the shell code was trying to do with a, a, another little utility that we wrote. Um, I actually went on site one time with some salespeople, and I was kind of explaining the whole idea of JavaScript obfuscation. And one of the guys there was like, "Yeah, but there's only a few people that actually can can make those big long lines of numbers and actually op uh, obfuscate JavaScript." I kind of looked at him, I was like, no, actually, it's, it's pretty simple. Like 99% of the people actually just copy and paste things. They don't really know what they're doing. So, <laughs> so I, I showed him an example of this. It's actually really cool. It's called JJ Encode. Have you guys ever played with this? It's actually a, a really cool JavaScript uh, obfuscating tool. There's also another one called J, um, JS four letter expletive that begins with the letter F. Um, just Google it and it'll bring you to the site. It works really well as well. So I, I, had, I showed him this example of, of this little tool. If you click the eval, you can see, oh, sorry, it's obnoxious. You see alert, hello JavaScript. We popped it out here. And I showed him you can just change the variable name right here. So if I wanted just to change from, instead of dollar signs, I just wanted to use Glenn as my variable name. You see it still works. It's, it's quite simple just to change how the obfuscation works. You can even palindrome it, palindrome it. You have 2,203 2, letters and characters just to obfuscate alert, hello, JavaScript. So it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. There's a ton of them out there. And I just showed them how you can just copy and paste your code into this and do exactly what he said it takes somebody that's crazy smart to be able to do. So I just want to kind of bring that up. So, so here we have our, our, our shell code, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to use another little utility we have called, uh, it's a really great name for it, called the shell code detector. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, take a look to see what the, um, 
Shelko was trying to accomplish. To make it nice and easy. All you gotta do is just look for the English. Can everybody see that? Let me make it a little bigger. So let me just scroll up a little bit before we look at that. You can see here, see the different jump call pop, play offsets, the distance, the XOR key. So that what we just looked at before is we took the XOR um, shell code, the encoded shell code. You see this, IE Explorer, HTTP www MIT edu and HTTP www CFERD CA images top dot gif. Pretty self-explanatory what this shellcode is telling your machine to do, right? Open up IE, go to these sites. Can anybody guess why there's two domains there? Why MIT is there? It's always interesting to see if anybody... Checker. Checker. Yep. A lot of people just, they, they're like, I don't know, they want to go to MIT. It's like, no, they're not trying to go to MIT. So one way to, this is a, another example of noise reduction. And in this case, it's dealing with, with sandboxes. So it, it's a lot of people have, you know, different security tools and stuff that they live and die by. Like people just love IPS. People just love sandboxes. People just love everything. And, and the whole point of this, um, this, this whole, you know, talk is to, to show how a single attack can beat all of them, you know, if they wanted to. So in this case here, it's, it's, it's going out to MIT.edu to see if it can actually um, get out to that site. Now, in a real sandbox environment, there's no way that a sandbox allows you to get onto the network and do what you need to do. So if you're running in a sandbox and this try to run, it would sit there and, and realize that it couldn't connect and then it wouldn't actually go out to cfer.ca and pull down top.gif, which as we'll see is the actual piece of malware. There's a lot of cool um, different ways, like newer ways to go out there and do it. A lot of the newer sandboxes and stuff have ways to check for this. Some, uh, some cool ones that I've seen recently is just doing checking the DNS cache. So what they'll do is they'll check to see if the machine ever connected to google.com. So everybody in here, I'm positive, has gone to Google before, so it'd be in your cache. Well, what you know, some different attacks are doing is saying, have they ever gone to Google? Have they ever gone to these common sites that everybody's been to? If not, then it just cuts out. Um, there's some cool ones with, uh, saw one recently, it was actually a jar file it was Tetris, and you'd actually have to play the game to get to 10,000 points before the, the attack kicked off. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So if you suck at Tetris, you're good if you're too dumb. If, uh, <laughs> um, a lot of other ones using, as far as like encoding content and sending it across, using the, the version number of the processor as the key to decode the content, sending the key with the attack. So just different ways like that to kind of evade a sandbox because the chances of the processor being the same as the, the victim. Or another one is using the time of the machine. So if it, especially if it's a targeted attack, using the system time as the key to decode the content. And unless everything is, you good? Okay. Unless everything exactly synced, it, it would never be able to run. So, yeah, there, here's a here's slide number two that we'll be looking at. This is a, a pretty good, it's actually very technical. It's a great white paper. If you want to learn how to um, evade sandbox technology, it's kind of low, but ISE, go to this site. It's awesome. It, it'll take a little while to read. It's pretty long, but it's a great, great paper. All right, enough of that slide. So now... What we're going to look at is we, we know let's assume that we're we're infected that you know we were in a sandbox we're running XP IE6 and we went to Seaford CA images top dot gif so as you can assume this is probably the the gif file is actually the piece of malware that's going to be coming down and getting us so let's take a look at the top dot gif file. Excuse me. So here, this is the, the f uh, another like the first example that we're going to be looking at in regards to um, some more noise reduction. So everybody knows what this is, right? 
gift 89a it's the magic number everybody knows what that stuff is for right it tells your operating system what application to use to open the file uh, this is the easiest way to evade almost all host-based security tools and web gateways like content firewalls and stuff the reason is is uh, it's the whole idea of down selection so you can't look at every single thing coming across the network right so what AV and just different security tools a lot of times have to kind of narrow down their focus on things that are really malicious here is a list of some common magic numbers everybody knows where's the numbers the bottom one the or the, the bottom two the MZ header obviously it's the the Windows executable everybody knows when you find that doesn't matter if you re rename the extension you know hello.txt you know the magic numbers usually still MZ in the case if you're renaming it there a lot of people I find curious have no idea that you can use ZM as well so a lot of times if people are writing custom signatures looking for something uh, like uh, file specific they're only look for the the MZ header and the stuff and have no idea that ZM even exists so in the case of like antivirus and, and like web gateways and stuff like that if they saw this file coming across the network they would assume it's just an image file right it's a gif file how bad could it really be i'm going to keep looking for executable files for mz maybe i'm going to look for some um you know java file whatever they, they're going to be looking for but the easiest way to evade those type of things is just to put the magic number in ahead of the file and I'll show you exactly an example of using a, the uh, Anubis sandbox. I'll just completely not even take a look at it. So what we're going to do now is we know the magic number is is says GIF 89. It's um, it's not actually a, a GIF file though. What we're going to do is use another little utility called XFile that will take it's actually a, an encoded file and it'll sh decode the content and rip all the f the actual encoded files out of the, the GIF file. Um, so there's an encrypted embedded files. We see here, so top.gif, first one is DLL is corrupted, that's what all those little question marks are for. Here you see the XOR key, it's a 32-bit DWOR key. It's a DLL, DLL, the last one's the actual executable. So in this, if you actually look at, you'll never see MZ anywhere in this content. But just by decoding it, by putting the GIF89, making sure an AV engine and stuff aren't, won't look at it, and, and encoding the content with just simple, simple, well, with XOR, you can completely get the, the file itself across um, onto the box itself. So what we could do here is to kind of prove a point, we can um, where is it? thing still working so I, let's see I've done this before zero out of 42 <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes that's how I wanted to leave the presentation <laughs> that's only the first time that's ever happened on his Mac it'll never happen again so, as you can see, 0 out of 42 detected it. You take the, the executable file that we extracted out of there and you would have uploaded it, all 42 AV engines would have been able to detect it. It's the same concept as normalizing the traffic like we did with the obfuscated JavaScript. If we, once we deobfuscated it, everything would have been able to tell you, oh, that's shell code, you know, it's trying to do a heap spray. The same thing with, the, um, with that, that file. Once you decoded the content, everything would have been able to detect it. Well, that kind of ended uh, abruptly. <laughs> yes? So, question. So, I don't 